Faces of South Asia. I'm Isha. And I'm Sophie. We welcome you to join us in the Human Trafficking Awareness Summit held right here in Quincy, Massachusetts, in the United States of America in 2016. Human trafficking is a global trade of humans most commonly for the purpose of sexual slavery, forced labor, mostly fueled by poverty, gender discrimination, and runaway individuals. This may also include forced marriages and child marriages. Human trafficking has been reported in all 50 states, including Washington, D.C., and U.S. territories. FBI estimates about 100,000 to 300,000 are trafficked here in America today. 17,000 to 18,000 are trafficked right here in New England and Massachusetts being their prime destination. Many victims are not runaways or abandoned, but are from good families who are coerced by clever traffickers. Human trafficking is a $33 billion industry which ranks second to the drug industry today. Human trafficking is today's modern day slavery. Join me in the awareness and the action taken by U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Peter L. DiMaggio. His insights are priceless. Join me in the tireless action and vigilance of the Abolitionist Network, Director Sarah Dunham. Join me in understanding the slavery behind consumer products in the free trade campaign by Alexandra Carroll. Join me in the incredible service provided by the Freedom Clinic of Mass General Hospital and the doctors. Join me to understand the incredible service by Amira, Executive Director Stephanie Clark. Join me in thanking the play Body and Soul. Join me in thanking Alison Cruz, who works with real kids. And thank you, a special thanks to the Rivers for hosting the Trafficking Summit in Quincy, Massachusetts, and Mayor Thomas Koch. Join me to understand the incredible service by Amira, Executive Director Stephanie Clark. Stephanie Clark, and I'm the Executive Director for Amira. Uh, everybody was asked, what on earth does Amira mean? So Amira is an Arabic word, and it means princess. And in some Persian dialects, it actually means female warrior, which I find particularly awesome, because uh, this is kind of the business that we are in. And so a lot has already been said about what human trafficking is, what sex trafficking is, um, the medical piece, uh, the law enforcement piece. You know, we have our very own uh, Jack, what was it, Jack Bauer? Yes, so <laughs> the first time I met Peter, I'm like, this does not equate in my 24 brain. So, but I love Peter. Um, so I'm not gonna share too much on that. You guys are already educated, which I appreciate. Uh, what I want to talk about is now we have these women, what on earth do we do? And this is where it gets, you know, very difficult. And that's kind of the work that we are involved in. So Amira exists to provide a refuge for women over the age of 18 who were sex trafficked. That is our mission. That is what we go after. And we do that by providing a safe home. We are more than just a place with beds. We are more than just, you know, here's a shelter. In fact, I actually don't even use that terminology for us because we're not a shelter. We are a home and a community that they are coming into. And we offer a whole person care program. And that's what I'd like to talk to you a bit about. Um, there are, just so you understand, um, 
the statistics of what's happening in New England. There are only four safe homes in all of New England for this specific work, working with survivors of human trafficking. There are a total of 17 beds in all of New England. So that's not just Massachusetts, that includes all the other wonderful states as well too. Amira, we have eight of those 17 beds. Yeah. So, and yes, my goal, my hope is to duplicate and to make many, many more homes because I do wholeheartedly believe in the model that we are offering um, and in what we are doing with these women. And so I want to talk a bit about what we are doing. We offer a whole person care program, which is individualized and trauma-informed. So these are lots of keywords, buzzwords. So let's talk a bit about what that means. Whole person means that we are going after their entire being. Physical, mental, emotional, social, vocational, and spiritual. That is what a human being is. And we help these women by helping them recover through their trauma that they've endured in all of those six avenues. Right off the bat, when they come into our home, we discover that they have a lot of physical needs. I have yet to meet a woman that's in this that's not a drug addict, although apparently it does exist because Peter had <laughs> somebody that was. Um, but I have yet to meet one that's not. And so their physical care, right off the bat, is helping them with their drug addiction. Um, it, you can imagine what they've had to endure, what they have gone through. Of course they want drugs in order to block away everything that they've had to endure. So I empathize and I, and I feel for them, but at the same time, I don't want them to have to live the rest of their life doing heroin. Um, that is not a way to live. And so our job is to help them discover a new path, which means we get them to a lot of NA meetings, smart recovery meetings, outpatient treatment for addiction recovery, and help them set up the steps to be able to just begin to do life without drugs. And what does that mean? We give them a home where they can discover what that means, and then we begin to help them with the rest of their physical needs. Because now that they're off drugs, their bodies have actually physically endured a ton of stuff and it kind of comes back and a lot of pain begins to come back. Physical pain, back problems, horrible teeth problems, you know, the, the medical piece is off the charts, uh, which the MGH Treatment Clinic has spoken to you about. And so we connect with wonderful people like the Freedom Clinic, um, other doctors and dentists. Dentists are huge. Um, there's so much that needs to happen. Um, you know, I have a woman that essentially we're looking at the fact that we have to get her implants on her entire bottom teeth um, because her only option right now if we go to like a clinic is that she's going to get dentures. She's 31. You know, and she's looking at the prospect that she's going to have to have dentures for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And so we are actively searching for amazing partnerships where people will be like, yeah, I'm going to do this pro bono. Because implants, if you don't know, are like five grand a shot for one tooth. Mm -hmm. All of her bottom teeth. Think about that for a minute. So their physical need is incredible, and that's what we help with in their first phase, which lasts about 90 days. Getting them their paperwork, getting them on health insurance, getting them an ID, um, all these things have been taken away, lost, and so we need to help them with just the basics of setting up their life. Finding a counselor that can help them uh, is massive. Even if we find a counselor that's you know available, the problem then becomes if the woman does not connect with that counselor. I mean, if you guys have counselors of your own, you know it takes time to be able to trust that human and individual with your stuff. They've been through so much, and so it takes a little bit of time, trial and error. They might not like that person, so we have to find somebody new. And so setting up with the counselors, they can begin to address the mental and emotional hurdles. Because now they are off the drugs, they're excited, they're celebrating that, they're celebrating being oftentimes, you know, a month clean within our home. And then all of a sudden everything seems to come up. Remembering what everything that they did, remembering why they did this stuff, remembering the pain, the emotion, all that. And so a counselor is huge in helping them begin to recover through this process. We are not their counselors. Um, my staff at the Safe Home, they all have masters of counseling, they all have a mental health piece but we are not going to be that for them because we want to set up their services outside of our safe home. So that way, as they progress through their program, they have this amazing community outside of our home that when they leave our home and graduate, they still have that community. And so even though we are very equipped and ready to help them and want to love them and do everything we can, 
we're not going to be that for them. Instead, we're going to find that for them in the community. And so that means we have to continue to train people on what this whole traumatization from being sex trafficked is. We need to continue to educate um, those that are service providers on how you can help these women. And we need more people to be able to step up and say, I'm going to, I'm going to begin to work with this clientele because we're going to see more and more unbelievable problems like this. So the first phase is a lot of helping them with their physical, mental, and emotional recovery. As they take a hold of their program and begin to not just say, well, I'm doing this because I'm here and this is what I have to do, but instead say, this is my, this is my chance. We've seen three women already begin to say that, and they are now in phase two of their program, where they actually begin to address their social and their vocational goals in recovery. So I have one woman that she started a job two weeks ago, which is so awesome. She's, she loves it. It's a part-time job. It's definitely not what she wants to do with the rest of her life, but she's so excited to be going out, to be making money, to kind of rediscover that value of worth, that sense in herself that I am worth what I am doing. I don't need to sell myself in order to make money. That is a massive hurdle. Um, we work with local people that help them with their career development, with writing resumes, and even that part can take weeks at times because they have nothing to write on the resume. They have nothing to put down for references. They feel like they have no skills whatsoever, even though we know that they are the most heavy women on the entire planet. They have survived so much on their own. They just can't connect those dots that I'm worth continuing to go forward. It takes a lot um, as well for us to begin to partner with corporations to be able to say, you need to take a chance on these women. Give them an internship. Let them be your receptionist. Let them answer phones. Let them you know, file away paperwork, rather than them going down to Dunkin' Donuts. Because that is what they look at. Like, that's all I'm worth. Not, not that there's anything wrong with Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Um, except for I'm from the Midwest, so there's many things wrong with this. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, you know, when they see that that's all I can do, that really is demoralizing to them. Um, and so, very quickly for them, that option of, well, I could go out and do this, because I know that that's what I could do. And I could make a whole lot more money doing that. And so even though they have progressed so far, we hit hurdles with them while they're in phase two of discovering their value, discovering their worth, helping them move through that depression. Um, and we help them connect socially as well. We do that by engaging them with places like CrossFit gyms. Uh, the local Y actually gives us memberships for free, which is awesome and wonderful. Um, we do all sorts of engagements with, um, we have equine therapy, so they go out and hang out with horses. Don't ask me. I don't know. They love it though. Um, and apparently, horses like can sense your how you're feeling and connect with you on that, and it actually calms them down. And it's really neat. So horse therapy. Um, but we help them to kind of connect with the community that they can engage socially, um, which is massive because they are high anxiety. They have so much trauma. And even though they can talk to us and be normal with us, then when they are meeting a complete stranger, it's just something totally different. The, our social engagement also happens because we are a safe home, so we have to have somebody there 24 seven, which means we operate because of volunteers. So volunteers come in and they serve usually about a four or five hour shift. Now, we say this all the time. I mean, it's a four or five hour shift. I can use you for one shift a month and we can operate very well. If you want to connect with the women, though, and actually help them with their social recovery, you're going to have to serve maybe like once a week, four-hour shift, and commit that time. Because then they will see you more often. They'll begin to talk to you. Not that they're going to share their story with people. They'll just talk to you and try to live a normal life and be able to engage with you. And so we operate because of amazing volunteers that actually help them connect socially once again and help them be able to move through that and engage with just what does it mean to be able to live life? Uh, all of our volunteers that come in, they kind of engage on just various skills. So if you're there in the evening, you cook a meal together, you learn how to cook meals. They love to cook. They make amazing scrambled eggs. It's really, really good. Every time I'm there in the morning, there's scrambled that smell, and I'm like, mm, it's so good. 
Um, and so they do that. We have volunteers that come in that teach them about creative writing stuff, that come and teach them how to quilt, that teach them how to garden. But these volunteers that are doing that now, they've been serving already since October. And now they're beginning to do that. So this is always my, my one thing. I came into this job a year ago. The number one request I got from people was, I would love to come to your home and teach the women yoga. And I'm like, okay. I don't know why. I had like literally probably 50 emails over this course. I would love to come teach them yoga. I'm like, okay. You know, what's up with this? I don't quite understand. And so my response always was, can you come, just hang out, because they need to get to know you. They're not going to have a complete stranger come in and teach them yoga. You know, if you come, you hang out, they get to know you, they get to love you, they get to respect you. Then over time, you can talk to them about, can we do this when I come next time? And sure enough, that's how it works. So the people that are teaching them how to garden and teaching them about, you know, budgeting skills and teaching them about, um, you know, creative writing, they actually have been coming now consistently for months. And now they are beginning to do that. And the women are very much engaged with them, which is great. So please don't request to come teach them yoga. <laughs> Instead, just show up. That's the biggest thing. If you are wanting to be a part of providing you know, any sort of care to a woman that has gone through this, you have to show up. Which, in our day and age, seems very difficult. Our schedules are busy. Our lives are busy. We are self-consumers. And in order to be in any part of aftercare for survivors of sex trafficking, means that you lay yourself down. And that's actually why I'm in this job. Uh, the other part of our recovery is spirituality. There's spiritual being. Every single human being on this planet is a spiritual being, no matter what you believe in. You're a spiritual being. You have a spirit. We, as a mirror, we exist because it was a group of Christians that came together and said, we're sick and tired of hearing about this, and at that time, there was no safe homes. And they said, we need to, we need to form some uh, because this, this can't happen. So they responded because of their faith, but we never force our faith on anyone. I will never be these women's second pimp. I will just live my faith out in front of them because this is why I'm doing this. My motivation and my goal is the fact that a guy named Jesus said, greater love has no one than this that will lay down his life for his friends. That's my motivation, that I lay down my life. And so if you are going to be a part of a woman's life that has gone through this, you have to lay down your life. Trust me, I have a crazy busy life. I have a husband. He's going to climb Mount Rainier soon. You know, it's just like we have so much happening all the time. And we choose instead to lay down all of our stuff and our needs and say, we're putting these women first. That's what that takes. And that is so anti-culture. It is so anti-America. It is so anti-everything that we're being told by the self-help books, you know, like, empower yourself and all that kind of stuff. I, I'll be honest, I feel like I'm the most empowered person when I'm helping them. Because I'm laying myself down. So that's why we do this. And in the process of doing this, we help them with their spiritual recovery. Now, a lot of people get freaked out when I say that because they're like, well, what are you doing? Are you sitting down? Are you, you know, forcing Jesus upon them? No, I don't think he wants to be forced on anyone. Um, last I checked. <laughs> All we do is we do this because of our faith and, and live that out. I'm never going to lie to them about who I am. It's not right. But I also am going to help them discover what they need to discover. They have been massively spiritual tra spiritually traumatized. If you came into this life, uh, probably somebody said this, the average age for a woman to get caught up in this life is 14, right? So if you came into this life at 14, you're in Amira's house now, which means you're over the age of 18. Our average age for a woman is in their mid-20s. So let's say she's the norm. She got up when she's 14, she's with us when she's 24. That's 10 years where year after year, day after day, you are asking that question, who is out there that this is my life? Why on earth is this happening to me? And they are never, trust me, they are never given that opportunity while they are in the life to ask that question. And so now they come to us, and if we don't help them ask that question, then we have not helped them recover as a whole person. So that's what we do. I meet with them every single week, and I help them ask those questions. 
What do you need to ask God if he can answer you today? What do you believe about God? And all I do is ask them, what do you believe? I don't tell them what I believe. I just ask them what they believe. And I ask them, how would you like to explore this? And if they tell me I want to explore this as a Buddhist, then I say, okay, let's help you explore this as a Buddhist and find a community out there that will help you explore that. If they tell me I want to explore this through Islam, through the Muslim religion, I help them explore that through that. If they tell me I want to do this as a Christian, I hand them a Bible, I say, okay, let's help you explore this through that and find a community out there that can do that. And that's what we do. It's really freeing for me particularly because I never have to do anything other than what I know. And it's been massively empowering for them because they've been able to ask very serious questions that they've never been able to ask before. And I've had such a great you know, honor of just being there for them and loving them. And that's what it means to be a part of their life. We give them time and space and we love them. They were given some version of love out there that is not love. That's what breaks my heart about this, is that they were told I love you. And whatever that was, was not it. And so now we actually are loving them, which means we lay down our life for them. We give them time to recover, even though they give us horrible crap. <laughs> we just love them in return, which means I see a therapist. <laughs> You think I'm joking. <laughs> I'm so not. That's part of this. I mean, uh, oftentimes people ask, well, what on earth do you do for yourself? I get a massage every single month. I see my therapist quite often because I need to take whatever they are dishing out because it's not actually at me. It's because of all the trauma that they are working through. And so I need to take it and I need to love them back and then I need to take all that and take it to my therapist and just work through everything that I just heard and, and work that through. And every single person in Alamira, we all have a counselor that we see quite regularly. We encourage our volunteers to see a counselor as well, too. Self-care, this is massive and huge. I go to the gym a lot and run and get rid of a lot of stuff through that way as well, too. But that's whole person care. As you can see, that lasts a long time. Our program can be a year to two years that a woman will be with us which means when we fill up our home later this year with all eight beds, it's gonna be a little while before we have more beds available, which means I need to open another home. And I'm very much wanting to do that, but that just means I need more money. The biggest thing about wanting to save home is we have to have sustainability, and you have to go slow in order to have that sustainability. I can fill up my home tomorrow. In fact, we've had six phone calls two weeks ago, two more phone calls last week, and two more phone calls this week from Peter, from the FBI, from Prisons of the Maine, from MGH, saying, hey, we a woman. And we're like, okay. And all we can do is do an intake interview, and then we will take one woman, because we take about one woman a month, because we need to give her so much attention during that first month, so that way she feels safe, she feels connected, she feels loved, she gets everything that she needs. And then once she's moving forward, then we can take another woman, until we're full. And then, We'll graduate women and we'll take more women. <coughs> that is a slow process and that's an expensive process. Our safe home budget for one safe home right now is $350,000 every single year. We operate because of donors. We are 100% donor funded. There is no state money for this, which everybody goes, huh? I pay taxes. Yes, you do. <laughs> And in fact, your taxes actually help us because we are, we are able to give women health insurance because of our taxes that we pay. So please keep paying your taxes. <laughs> um, but there is no actual state funding for survivor aftercare. We are working on that. You know, people like Senator Martini, he's awesome. He's working on getting a bill to strengthen that. But this is years away, and even then, they have to apply for that, and there's no guarantee that I'm going to get that. So we will continue to be donor funded, which means it means that if you are a part of this movement, if you want to say that you are a fight, uh, part of this fight against trafficking, then that means you actually have to monetarily support somebody that's in this work. You can't call yourself an anti-trafficker unless you are monetarily giving into this. That doesn't mean that you have to give to Amira, you can give to Sarah Durfee, and 
work that she does, you can give to Jasmine Marino and the work that she does, you can give to whoever that's in this and say this is the part that I'm actively supporting. And I'm not saying you have to give me $10,000, although that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm saying give me 25 bucks every month. If I have 350 people doing that, that's half of my budget. Yeah, it's, it's that simple. And so that's actually how we are looking at because I have a huge army of people that give me about 25 bucks every single month. And that sustains us and that keeps us moving forward and we keep growing. I'm going to grow that to like 600 people so I can open up another home. <laughs> and then another home after that because I do believe in the model that we are doing. The last buzzword that I said in there was trauma informed. Everybody loves this word, right? Everybody wants to be trauma informed. What does that actually mean? <laughs> Trauma-informed means that you are focusing in on the individual that was traumatized. That's what that means. So it doesn't mean that we understand trauma. It doesn't mean that I understand the trauma that they've endured. It doesn't mean anything like that. It means that I'm focused in on that individual and their recovery because they are the person that was traumatized. So this means that we are individualized with our care. So one woman, she's going to come in and she will have been vulnerable because she was a drug addict. And that was why the pimp found her and preyed upon her and then brought her into this life. She has a very different recovery than another woman that was, you know, had somebody that died that made her vulnerable and a pimp found her and then made her a drug addict. They had two very different recoveries and two very different traumatizing experiences. And so trauma informed means that we are addressing what they've been through and the recovery that they need rather than giving them kind of this blanket program that we think will work. That's the work that we do. Beliefs of human trafficking in a faraway land is really not true because it's right here in New England, in Massachusetts, in the United States of America. We thank you to join us in this difficult, heartbreaking human trafficking awareness, action, and solution summit in 2016. We hope that we can make a difference, join us in our campaign. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Isha. And I'm Sophie.